Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, so first, I should mention that it seems like my internet is a little bit shaky today. I'm not sure why, but if I get disconnected, I'll try to switch internet providers and come back. So be patient with that. Um, and so today, we're going to be talking about differential cross sections. And our first part of the discussion is just going to be classical. We're not going to be doing any quantum mechanics. And then we'll switch over to the quantum version about halfway through the lecture. So the idea here is we're going to consider some particles impacting on a target. And so let's draw a picture of what that might look like. Here's our target here. We have some particles coming in. Okay, and this is going to be the Z hat direction. And so they're going to get scattered, but before talking about how they get scattered, let's just first talk about how many particles there are, which we describe in terms of a flux of incoming particles. which is defined in the following way. We say that there are N particles per unit area per unit time. Okay, and so we're assuming this is constant in time. We're, we're not varying how fast we're sending in particles. And we're not varying what the density of them is over the size of the target. So, and constant over an area large in the xy plane, perpendicular to the z direction, compared to the target. Okay, and now what happens is we count the number of particles we see getting scattered. So there's our target again. Here's the incoming direction. And here's an outgoing direction. And so this is the spherical coordinate angle theta. Okay, and to describe those, we're going to let S equal the particles per unit time in a solid angle, which means between uh, cos theta and cos theta plus a little bit, we'll call it d cosine theta, and between phi and phi plus d phi. So collectively, that is known as d omega. I'm sorry, Professor. Very okay. good. Yeah, I'm lost a little bit. So I, I was busy writing. What happened here? Something's coming in and it's being deflected. That's right. We're sending in particles and they're being deflected. Off of the surface? Off of this target, whatever it is. OK, so what are we trying to calculate here? We're, we're not trying to calculate anything right now. We're trying to define what differential cross-section is. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we send in, we're sending in n particles per unit area per unit time, and out goes, we observe s particles per unit time in the solid angle. And so clearly, if we make our solid angle, which is infinitesimal, if we make it twice as big, we'll see approximately twice as many particles. And if we send in, if we make n twice as big, just send in n twice as many particles, we should get twice as many particles coming up. So that means that the ratio s over n times d omega should be a constant 
uh, with respect to those changes. And that constant of proportionality is what we define to be the differential cross section. So we write it like that, d sigma by d omega. It's the differential cross section. That's the definition of it. Okay, and that makes sense because again, if we double n, then s should double. And if we increase d omega, then uh, ds by d omega should increase in the same way. Okay, so that's just the definition and that has units of area. Just from the things that it's defined in terms of, if you look at the, their, their uh, units. Okay, and so then you can also define the total cross section just by integrating over all the solid angles. So that's sigma. Sigma is an integral d omega of the differential cross section. Okay, or if you just write it all out, it's integral zero to two pi d phi integral minus one to one d cosine theta, d sigma by d omega. Okay, and that also has units of area because the angles that we've integrated over don't have units. Okay, so now we've defined differential cross-section and cross-section. It's often true in problems that if you look at d sigma by d omega, which by the way, we can write as differential d sigma over d phi times d cosine theta. And so it could depend on phi and theta, but often it doesn't depend on phi. So for example, that happens if you have a spherically symmetric target, then the answer won't depend on phi. This is called azimuthal symmetry. That's just a $10 word or $10 phrase that means it doesn't depend on phi. And so in that case, then we can just write d sigma by d cos theta. We can define that. And so sometimes you'll see that listed as the differential cross section. And that just means you integrate over the phi that it doesn't depend on. And so if you're integrating over phi and it doesn't depend on phi, that just means you're multiplying by two pi. Okay, so that's an important special case that will arise, but it doesn't always have to be true. Okay, and intuitively, what the cross section is telling you is the effective size of the target, not its actual size, but the effective size that it has as far as scattering particles. And so that depends on the type of scattering that you're doing. In other words, what the particles are, how they're interacting and stuff like that. So I'm writing for that type of scattering. So a given target might and will probably will have a different cross section for electrons or protons or any other different kind of particle. Okay, so let's do a classic example and a classical example, which is we're gonna send in little tiny spheres scattering off big heavy spheres. So I can call these marbles or table tennis balls or something like that. This is just supposed to impart to you that the radius of these things is very small and they're very light. bouncing off of bowling balls, which is just supposed to impart 
to you that their radius is not negligible. So we're going to call that radius capital R and also that they're very heavy. So they don't move when these little puny marbles hit them. So it doesn't move when hit, which just means that we can treat it as stationary. And so the picture that we're going to do, here's our big bowling ball. And we're going to draw a horizontal dashed line just through its center. And then we're sending in our little marble to bounce off it. And a very important thing that we want to define is that distance there, which we're going to call B. That's the traditional symbol for it. And this is called the impact parameter. Okay, and here's the general strategy for solving these problems when you're doing classical physics, which of course we won't be doing much of. And that is to find the differential cross section, which in this case, because we have spherical symmetry of the target, won't depend on, on phi, it only depends on theta. Okay, the strategy is to relate the impact parameter B to the scattering angle. And so what we're going to do, which is theta. Okay, and so that's this thing hits and it goes off. That's the angle theta that we're defining when it bounces off the ball. And so to do that, you just need to do some geometry. So in an attempt to make the geometry clearer, I'm going to redraw the picture. So let's draw our big bowling ball here as a perfect, that's a perfect sphere. Here's the dash line through the center of it. And then up here is our line. This is the distance B, the impact parameter. And this is the line followed by the marble and then it bounces off at an angle like that. So it's doing that kind of trajectory. Okay, and so now to do the geometry, let me draw the radius of the bowling ball here. And then that's the impact parameter again. And I'm gonna call this angle alpha. Okay, and so alpha is equal to the arc sine of B over R, or in other words, sine of alpha is B over R. But also if I draw this imaginary line going up like that, that angle is also alpha because when something bounces off something else, it uh, preserves the angle. And then the angle of reflection is the same of, as the angle of incidence. So that angle is also alpha. And then meanwhile, that's the actual scattering angle that we want. So from the geometry, the scattering angle of this trajectory is 180 degrees, otherwise known as pi minus two times alpha. So that's pi minus two arc sine B over R. Okay, and our strategy is to solve for the impact parameter, which we can now do. The impact parameter is the radius of the target ball times sine pi minus theta over two, which is also known as R times cosine theta over two by a trig identity. Professor? Yeah? Sorry, would you mind just scrolling up a little bit, just a little bit? Okay. I'm sorry. All right. Never mind. I'll just review it later. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, um, so now let's let as we as we defined before, n equals the particles per unit area per unit time. Okay. Then 
the number per unit time with impact parameter between B and B plus DB is just going to be, we're going to multiply by the area. So that's N times the area of the, if I draw a view from, this is the view from the Z direction where the particles are coming. That's B, that's B plus DB. And so we're calculating that area. Okay, and that's two pi B. That's the circumference of the inner circle times DB, otherwise known as the differential of area in terms of the impact parameter. So that's the area of this annulus. Okay, so we're just multiplying particles per unit area per unit time times area. And now we're going to write that in terms of theta, which we've got up here because we know what B is in terms of theta. Okay, so we translate this into n 2 pi r cosine theta over 2 times db is r times d, the differential of cosine theta over 2, which is otherwise known as minus 1 half sine theta over 2 d theta. Okay, and so the whole thing works out to minus n pi r squared times cosine theta over two, sine theta over two, d theta, which is otherwise, this part is otherwise known as sine theta over two by a trig identity. And so this whole thing is minus n pi r squared over two. The differential of sine theta times d theta is otherwise known as minus d cosine theta. So I can get rid of the minus sign and just write d cosine theta here. All right, so now we'll put that together so S in our definition, the number of particles per unit time between phi and phi plus d phi. Oh, I didn't leave enough space there. And cosine theta and cosine theta plus d cosine theta is just equal to n pi r squared over 2 d cosine theta times d phi over 2 pi. So I've just multiplied by d phi and then divided by 2 pi because when I integrate over d phi, I'm going to get 2 pi. So this whole thing is n radius of the target ball divided by 4 times d omega. And now we have the ingredients we need to calculate d sigma by d omega because its definition is that it's s over n d omega. That's n r squared over four d omega divided by n times d omega. Notice the n's cancel out that's a hallmark of the differential cross section. It's not supposed to depend on how many particles you send in. It's a observable where that cancels out. And also the size of the differential angle cancels out. And so we are left here with just R squared over four, which is a constant. So that's a very unusual result. It's very special about scattering from a hard sphere or an impenetrable sphere. It doesn't usually happen. But in this case, that makes everything nice and easy.
d sigma by d cosine theta is just two pi times that, which is otherwise known as pi r squared over two. And now we can integrate that to get sigma, we're integrating minus one to one d cosine theta times our constant, which is pi r squared over two. And the integral from minus one to one of one is just two. So this works out to be pi r squared. Okay, so we've calculated the cross section to scatter little teeny marbles off of a big bowling ball and it's just the area that you see when you look from very far away at the at the bowling ball. Okay, so it's kind of just what you might expect in this particular example. So this case has two unique features not usually seen in classical problems. One is the differential cross section is a constant. Now, when we do quantum mechanics, we're going to find out that that actually is not uncommon. In quantum mechanics, that happens a lot when you're doing scattering at low energies. Okay, but the other feature is very unusual, both in classical and quantum mechanics. And that is just that the cross section in this case just happened to be the size of the object as an area. Okay, so this is otherwise known as the geometrical cross section of the object, but geometrical cross section and the actual cross section are usually very different things. Okay, any more any questions on that example before we do another one? All right, so here's another classical example, and I'm not going to actually go through this because, again, this is classic, classical physics, but I'm just going to quote you the answer. And it turns out we're going to do the quantum version of this later anyway. So this is Rutherford scattering. So Rutherford scattering is just scattering of a charged particle off another very heavy charged particle. Okay, and so you're talking about a Coulomb potential. The Coulomb potential is the number of charges in the heavy target times the charge on the proton divided by R. Okay, so that could be, for example, a nucleus there's our plus ze nucleus and then we're sending in some charge like that and it's going to get attracted maybe my program decided i wanted to draw a straight line even though i didn't okay so it does something like that okay and so i'm assuming charge one so it's like it's an electron so d sigma by d omega is going to be z squared e to the fourth it turns out over 16 e squared i'm just quoting the answer for you we're not deriving it sine to the fourth theta over two where theta is that deflection angle okay so um the deflection angle when the deflection angle is very small, this thing actually blows up. So let's draw a picture. So note, d sigma by d omega blows up for small theta. In fact, if you graph it as a function of cosine theta, from minus one to one, it does something like this, right? It blows up here. And so the thing is, that's a problem if you're going to try to integrate to get the total cross section. In fact, you'll get infinity for the total cross section. 
So only by defining, basically changing the problem a little bit, by defining a minimal scattering angle, minimal, then you can get a finite answer. So you just say, okay, we're only interested in events or trajectories where the scattering angle is larger than some minimum value. So then can get finite integrated cross-section. Okay, and so if you do cross-section for theta greater than theta min, Okay, so we're going to still integrate from zero to two pi d phi, but now we're only integrate, we're going to integrate from minus one to cosine theta min when we do the d cosine theta integral. Okay, and then the rest of this is the differential cross section, so I'm just going to rewrite that. By the way, okay, E is the energy. I should have mentioned perhaps. Okay, but now that integral is a finite integral now. It's equal to z squared e to the fourth over the energy squared times, it turns out pi over four times one plus cosine theta min over one minus cosine theta min. Okay, so as long as you say, I'm only interested in events where the, the particle scatters by more than some minimum angle, then you can get a finite answer. But if you try to take theta min to zero, this goes to infinity. So the, the total cross section is actually infinite, strictly speaking. So the interpretation of that is for Coulomb scattering, the particle is always scattered at least a little bit. This is measuring the effective area for scattering, but if it's always scattered a little bit, you shouldn't be surprised that the cross-section is therefore infinite. Okay, so particle always scattered a little bit, at least. Okay, and so that's why the total cross section is going to infinity. And this is said to be an infinite range potential. So Coul Coulomb potentials are infinite range in the sense that you're getting infinity for the total cross section. But there are other uh, potentials you can write down and we will do so where even though the particle is always scattered at least a little bit, you still get a finite answer for the total cross section because when you, when you integrate a function that may uh, uh, always exist, it doesn't have to be infinite. Okay, one more thing I should maybe say about this is even though we didn't derive it, classically the way this is derived is always the same you define the impact parameter B, and then you work out what's the relation between B and the angle theta, and then you do exactly what we did for the hard sphere scattering example. So the, the hard part of the classical problem is always to find the relation between the impact parameter and the scattering angle. For quantum mechanics, that is not the, the path we will follow. It has nothing to do with how we'll do it in quantum mechanics. Okay, so in fact, now we're ready to graduate back to, to quantum mechanics. Okay, so let's figure out how this is gonna work in quantum mechanics. Recall from last time we had decided, or I had asserted without proof, but we'll eventually prove it, that the wave function looked like this. So there was an incoming beam, e to the i k z, and then there's an outgoing 
spherical wave, which had this form. And I haven't told you what that function f sub k of theta phi is, but it depends on the angles and it depends on k, which is telling you the energy of the particle. So from that, the probability per unit volume Recall that's just the square of the wave function. Okay, and if we do this, even including the time dependence, because we're doing a stationary state, the time dependence actually doesn't matter when I take the complex square. And so that's just the square of this stationary state wave function. And now we can split it into two parts because we can say, okay, if we're really far away from the target in the beam area, then this is the only thing that matters. Okay, and so in initial beam, the total probability per unit area is going to be so we're going to take our wave function and square it. But now we're only including the initial beam part of it. And then we're going to multiply by the speed that these particles are moving at, which is the momentum, which is h bar k over m times the elapsed time. So that's delta t elapsed time. Of course, the total probability should be proportional to how long you wait, how long you're willing to look at it for. This is the speed. Okay, and so this whole thing put together is the length of the beam on target. So that's when I'm multiplying a length times a probability per unit volume here. Then I'm getting a probability per unit area. Okay, and so just to simplify that, the e to the i k z squared doesn't do anything. And so we get one over two pi cubed, h bar k over m times the elapsed time. All right, so that's basically playing the role of what we said before was little n. And now we want to think about the scattered wave. And so we assume that we have a detector at position angles theta and phi with solid angle. Every detector has some solid angle associated with it. And we're going to assume our detect detector is infinitesimally small. So it has solid angle d, d omega. Okay, so here's the cartoon. There's our target. Way out here is our little detector. Okay, that distance is r. That angle is theta. And so if we're asking what's the total probability of being scattered into that solid angle. Okay, so let's write that out. So when we do this, now we're going to ignore the beam because we're assuming we're gonna be really far away and the beam is just this small thing here. So we're just gonna ignore this part and only worry about this part. Okay, so then we're going to square that wave function. So this is the square of our two pi to the three halves factor, our mysterious f sub k that we don't know what it is yet. And then we have our e to the i k r over r. Okay, so that is our probability per unit volume in the scattered wave. 
Okay, and then we're going to multiply by the area of the detector, which is R squared times the solid angle. And then finally do, this is probability per unit volume, sorry. And then to, to cancel the volume, we also need to multiply again by the speed, which is h bar k over m times the elapsed time. Okay, so this is the length perpendicular to the area of the detector. Oops. And so we're counting up uh, how many particles we should see if we wait a length of time delta t. Okay, and now we can simplify this a little bit. So the e to the i k r when we take the complex square goes away. And so we're left with the square of f k. We also have a two pi cubed. We have our d omega. And then we have our h bar k over m times delta t, just like we did in the incident wave. All right, so now we're finally ready to say, okay, what's d sigma by d omega? Okay, and what we do is we take our s, this is really s, and this rear was really n. Okay, we're going to take our, um, we're going to take our uh, s, from here, divide by n and then divide by d omega. And so just writing out all that stuff, the numerator is, a lot of this is gonna cancel. Because a lot of it is common factors. That's our S and then our N in the denominator is one over two pi cubed, H bar K over M, Delta T. And then there's our D omega factor in the definition of the cross section. Okay, and then that cancels that. And this cancels that, and that cancels that, and that cancels that. And we're just left with F sub K of theta and phi. Okay, which we haven't computed yet. Actually to compute that, we're gonna to need to specify what our potential is. But just to rewrite that, what we've learned is the differential cross section is just the square of this thing F sub K theta and phi which by the way is given the name of scattering amplitude. An amplitude is something that you square. And so the square of the scattering amplitude is nothing other than the differential cross section. So what that means is in quantum mechanics problems as opposed to classical mechanics problems, in trying to, instead of trying to get the relationship between the impact parameter and the scattering angle, what we want to do is we want to find the relation between the scattering amplitude and the scattering angle. Okay, so notes on this. One is the scattering amplitude has units of length. Okay, so we're always supposed to get units of length when we calculate it. That's note one. Note two is the R's canceled. Let's go back up here and see how, where that happened. It happened here. The R squared in the area of the detector canceled the one over R in the scattering wave function because that got squared as well. Okay, and so that's why intuitively the fk theta phi, when we wrote down the scattering wave function came with 
a factor one over R. If it hadn't, then we wouldn't have get, gotten a cross section that's independent of how far away the detector is, which we should. All right, so now we've boiled everything down to, we need to investigate how to get the scattering amplitude. So here's our goal is to show that at large R, psi of R is, this is something I've asserted, but told you I would prove it later. And now the time has come to prove it. That the wave function, that's not an X, that's a Z. Okay, and this is e to the i k r over r, scattering amplitude. Okay, and in doing so, we also want to identify what this is. In other words, figure out some way of calculating it, which is gonna depend on what the potential is. So if I give you a potential V, we have to have a way of calculating what that is. All right, so let's go ahead to do that. We're gonna start by saying that the Hamiltonian for which this is the stationary state has two parts. There's an H0 part and there's a V part where H0 is the kinetic part, okay, and V is a potential that depends only on R, and we're going to assume that that's only non-zero in a localized region, in some cases that will have to be an approximation. Okay, and then our e to the i k z corresponds to a ket actually with a factor of one over two pi to the three halves, which is an energy eigen ket only of h zero. It's not an energy eigen ket of the whole thing. Okay, and so our our k is k times z hat and h zero acting on k is equal to e times k where e is equal to h bar squared k squared over twice the mass of the particle. So we're, we're it looks like we're doing perturbation theory although we're not gonna actually do perturbation theory here. We're instead going to look for solutions to the full Schrodinger equation. That means with the full Hamiltonian. With the same energy as this scattering state. All right, so let's write down what that means. That means here's our Hamiltonian h0 plus v, it's gonna act on our scattering state psi. That's really the state that has this wave function. We want that to be the energy E times psi. Okay, and our next step is to rewrite this. I'm just gonna move the E to the other side actually move the H zero to the other side. So E minus H zero acting on psi is equal to V times psi. I haven't done anything yet. Now I'm gonna add zero to both sides, but on one side, I'm gonna call zero equal zero. And on the other side, I'm gonna call it E minus H zero acting on K, H zero is the kinetic part of the Hamiltonian. So the right hand side is zero just because uh, this is true. Okay, so I haven't really still done anything. 
So I've got D minus H zero acting on psi is V times psi plus E minus H zero acting on K. K is our initial beam wave function. Now I'm gonna do something that's a little bit tricky. I'm gonna act with this operator, E minus H zero inverse. So we're gonna to have to be very careful in a little bit to make sure that that thing's well-defined because inverse operators aren't always well-defined. But let's say I do that, then on the left-hand side, I get the scattering wave function that we want. Then I have one over E minus H zero acting on V, acting on psi. Notice I have to be careful because these are all operators. So I have to make sure that one over E minus H zero is on the outside. And then on the right-hand side, I have K. Okay, so we need to worry about this inverse operator blowing up. Or being undefined is a more precise way of, say, of saying blowing up. Okay, oh, but as an aside, notice that if, I'll just say in parentheses, note if the potential goes to zero, then we just get that psi is equal to k, which is what we want. If we, if we say there's no potential, then the complete wave function should just be the beam that we send in. Nothing happens to it and it stays, stays what it is. Okay, now to make sure this, this denominator doesn't cause a problem, what we're going to do is we're going to deform the energy into the complex plane by an infinitesimal amount. And so I'm gonna write psi equals k plus one over E minus H zero plus or minus I times epsilon, where epsilon is infinitesimal. In fact, it's a real infinitesimal thing. We're just gonna put it there to make sure nothing blows up and we're not dividing by zero. And then at the end, we're gonna take it to zero. Okay, and then that's acting on V times psi. So now we've got an equation that we wanna solve. This is known as the Lippmann-Schwinger equation. Okay, and it's gonna turn out, I said plus or minus I epsilon, it's gonna turn out that the plus sign is what we want, but that's not obvious yet, and it won't be obvious for a while. So for a while, for, I'm just gonna keep both signs, but it will turn out that the plus sign is what we want. Okay, so we're gonna keep both for now. Okay, and so when we're solving equ this equation, what we wanna do is we want to think of the incoming state and its energy as known and the potential as known. Okay, and we're supposed to solve for the scattering state, state psi, and then that state is going to have built into it the scattering amplitude when we solve it. Okay, so that's probably a good place to stop for today. And so the next lecture is going to be basically working out the solution to the Lippmann-Schwinger equation, paying special attention to the large R limit. That is where you're very far away from the target.
which is where you're supposed to put your detector. So the idea is the beam is very large compared to the target. Let me write this down. Beam size, much, much larger than target. But the detector distance is much, much larger than the beam. Okay, and that's why we're allowed to look at large R. And so when I say that the scattering amplitude is built in, that is really at large R. All right, so we will attack that next time. And in the meantime, don't forget that you have a homework due tomorrow night. And are there any questions on today's lecture? I did have one question. I was just curious, Professor. Um, the midterm, the ones that are not in the homework, could you please provide the solutions to those? Um, I will consider that. I'm not sure if I'm going to actually. I think the midterm was uh, fairly straightforward. So if you have an infinite amount of time, you should be able to do it. But uh, I think it's other than the one problem that I was concerned that people had trouble with because it. That, and that was on this homework. Um, I think it's time to move on and, and do other things. Okay. I was curious the solution to the extra credit part. I was curious about that. Um, okay, yeah, maybe we can, we can talk about that. It, that one should be very brief. So I can talk about that next time maybe. Okay. Thank you. All right. If not, then I will see you all on Friday.